Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com. And by Insight Squared, the revenue reporting you wish your CRM would provide. Visit insightsquared.com slash twist for a free consultation on how the fastest growing tech companies manage their sales pipeline. Happy to be here. So I'm going to kind of fly you through the sort of the 101 of funding your startup. Um, and if you have a question on a slide, like a clarification question, ask it midstream. If it's a, just a question that is not a clarification question, just park it for the end. And then I'm going to try to leave as much as time as I possibly can to answer questions that are already up there, questions you guys have. My goal is just to demystify the funding process, period. So before I uh, begin, I'd love just to raise a hand. How many of you in your next step are going to be looking for seed or seed prime financing? Okay, perfect. So the majority. Okay, because that's what this is focused on. If, it, if you guys were mostly A's, I'd have a lot. I'd have the wrong deck in front of you. Uh, okay, so with that, hold on, if, if I can... Okay, so just high level, I am at Freestyle Capital. We're a seed stage fund here in San Francisco. Um, it's me and two partners, and we're all serial entrepreneurs. So when I look out at you, I almost feel like I'm more you than the VC that I stand here in front of pretending to be. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I uh, started a company called WeddingChannel.com. I started a company called Bella Pictures. So I have raised a lot of money. So I often say, like, something that I was embarrassed about forever, I now just put out there of, like, I know how to fundraise, so hopefully this will be uh, effective for you guys. And now that I am on the other side of the table, I understand it even more than I ever did. Um, and so this is from something else, but I am a happily married mom of three kids, and I do like scuba diving with sharks. <laughs> Um, so just like to begin, I remember when I was you all, um, uh, an advisor of mine, we were about to uh, do a partner pitch, uh, at, at the time it was Kleiner Perkins. And I mean, it was, it was very daunting and he came and he sat with me and my partner for about an hour and he asked us a load of questions and we answered all of them. And at the end, he just shook his head and he said, my God, do I envy your ignorance. <laughs> and it was, he said, you think once you get financing, you're, you're, you're done, like, right? You're home free. Financing just lets you begin. And the climb is really, really hard. So I hope for a lot of you that you have partners or that you at least recognize, like, the funding is not the answer. Funding is not success. Success is getting to the top, right? So just keep that in perspective. So I'm mostly going to spend the, uh, my slide time talking about the pitch. What's included? What are you going to be telling VCs? What are VCs kind of looking for to answer as you're talking to them? And then I'm going to really quickly go over the process. And then your Q&A will take us wherever it takes us. So one thing that's really important for you guys to understand, and I kind of wish I had known this earlier in life, is what's called, you know, the power law of startups. And so to understand VC math is very enlightening for you all. And that is that we as VCs are constantly making investments in opportunities, right? Tons of risk, unknown. Nothing is a sure thing. And so what happens is some die, some do fine, and then you get a few that are just enormous returns that make up for that portfolio, okay? So I know lots of entrepreneurs who say, it's, like, it's crazy that people don't think this is a big enough opportunity. It's so big and it's such a sure thing. And so just so you understand when you're pitching, so you know who to pitch to, when we're listening, we have to be able to see that upside. Because if we don't, there's risk in anything you do. You might as well take risk in something that, if successful, could be really, really big. So once again, it's just something that I, I didn't get that when I was you all. And when I would hear, I'm not sure that market's big enough. And I'm like, it's four to six billion dollars. Like, how much bigger could you want? And I, I then under, I, I now, being on this side of the table, understand once now I understand my VC math. And once again, if anything I'm saying doesn't make sense or you have a clarifying question, raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going. Okay, so so... 
you're out there, you're going to pitch. And the key thing is to really know your audience, okay? So once again, VCs are looking for the upside that I just spoke about. So what does upside mean? So they need to know, there's a few things. Like one is, you want to know that there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. If you get to what you're saying you're going to do, is that a lucrative place to be? It could be an awesome product, service, whatnot, it could be hard as hell to get there. But if it's not going to then provide value, VC is not interested. So what's the upside? And then the other thing is like, are you the team to get to the other side of the rainbow, right? Do you have some unique qualities or each VC has a list of attributes of things they like to see in entrepreneurs? And so I often talk about this unfair advantage. I think unfair advantage is interesting because you may say, I, I don't have an unfair advantage. Going back to my first company example, this may not sound like a great advantage, was the fact that there were about uh, five other companies trying to do what we were doing at the same time. And, uh, but they were all doing it a different way. They were not working with the retailers. It was Amazon.com time. It was time to disintermediate the retailers. And we understood the market really well. And we said, that's great, but you get a better margin of no percent uh, of no market share because brides are not yet ready to register that way in a decade or two maybe, but not today. So our unfair advantage wasn't a Rolodex. It wasn't the jobs we had done before. It was our understanding of the market and the behavior of the market. So when I say an unfair advantage, it can be a host of things. It may be your Rolodex. It may be the job you just came from, but it can often be something a little bit more subtle. Um, Another key thing when you're talking about big idea is any idea that's big, and I mean really big, we're all wondering on the other side, like, why does this not exist yet? Like, why now? So you don't say it explicitly, like, so the reason why now is, but like you talk about the macro trends that are going on the market that is creating this opportunity or this need. And so that is part of, there's a big lucrative market. The way that you're going to do it is not 1% better. It's not 5% better. It's a 10x better experience for all of whatever that is. And that there are all these micro trend, macro trends that say, like, it, this, is to be, this is to happen now or possibly in a year. There's a reason why it couldn't have happened last year. Because otherwise, that question is looming in our head. Um, so a common mistake that uh, I see is the fact that you have to do a one-two punch. So you have to sell the dream. You have to sell the big vision. Once again, we're waiting for like the big idea, right? So you come out and you have this really big vision, um, but everyone starts somewhere. So you have to do this combination of we want to be this and we're starting here. And here's how I connect the dots from where we start to the big vision, um, but you don't just want to go in and say what you're doing tomorrow, because then often that's just not big enough. So a portfolio company of mine is called Narvar. Narvar sort of owns the post post purchase. Uh, experience for all the retailers. So if you buy on Nordstrom's.com, you get this experience that tells you exactly when your package is coming. It's called like their tracking product. If he had just sold that, no one would have been interested. He sold this whole experience that was going to live after the buy button and that he's starting with this and here's why it matters and then it goes here and here and here and then he owns this really big category. So he was able to sell the vision even though what he had right there and what he was selling to, to retailers at the moment was not that. So just kind of keep that in mind. And so, and I hope I don't offend anyone with this, but I will often talk about women. Um, and I would sometimes fall prey to this. We sometimes, and once again, generalization, women have, uh, this desire to, um, not want to uh, overpromise. There's no such thing as an overpromise on a vision. So don't feel like I, I can't go in there and say that because all I have today is this. Because the reality is, is it's a vision. It's what you want to be in five or ten years. And if you don't put that out there, you're not going to get the financing to begin. Ah, uh, yes, the Walker Corporate Law Group. Scott Walker has been a friend of the show since the beginning, and he is in fact the longest running continuous partner of This Week in Startups, and the Walker Corporate Law Group is 
a boutique law firm specializing in supporting startups and their founders, and they encouraged fixed fees. What is a fixed fee? They tell you what it's going to cost to accomplish the tasks that you need to get done, whether that's mergers and acquisitions or starting your company or licensing agreements, uh, your terms of service, privacy policies. All their lawyers have decades of experience, and they're not junior associates learning the job and the craft of being a great lawyer on the job with your startup. They're not experimenting on your startup with their legal. These are serious lawyers who know what they're doing and they charge a fixed fee because we all know billable hours reward inefficiency. So if you want to talk to the founder himself, Scott Ed Walker, you can call him directly 415-979-9998, 415-979-9998. Or you can email Scott Scott at walkercorporatelaw.com. Scott at walkercorporatelaw.com. Put Jason in the subject line. Jason sent me. Okay? Walkercorporatelaw.com, 415-979-9998. Thanks again, Scott Walker, for supporting independent media like This Week in Startups for, I think, seven or eight years you've been with us. I really appreciate that, Scott. And uh, it's great to have built uh, this little podcast with your support to support entrepreneurs, because I know that's what you love to do as an attorney. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Um, My name's Kayla. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, So yeah, I'm actually struggling with that because I did it yesterday, right? Like I I pitched and I said that this would be a possible 10x return opportunity, knowing very well in my gut and with the strategy that we have that it's going to be a 100x opportunity. But there's also a line between like being overly ambitious and also VC math realistic, right? And I'm coming from New York where if I say 100X and I don't have the numbers to back it up at this point in time, they're gonna be like, you're batshit crazy. But when I come here to Silicon Valley, it's like a completely different conversation and I'm coming without that knowledge. And so I feel like I I undersold myself, sold myself yesterday, but I'm wondering like, when is it kind of like a red flag in these VCs minds? Like, whoa, she's, you know, she's gotta chill out a little bit and be a little bit more realistic. So it's such a good question. So a couple things. One is I would say I recommend, and I know it's written a little bit different here, but uh, I stole this from something else we did, but I recommend you not tell VCs what the multiple is going to be. That's kind of our job. So when I talk about selling the vision, you should sell that there is this massive market. Like I'll think of like an Airbnb, right? Do you, billions of dollars spent in hospitality, all this unused space where people could have better experiences. You know, if, if things go all right, it could be this much in five years. So you can talk about revenue goals. But it, 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 I highly recommend that you don't talk about a 3X, a 10X, because nobody knows, and you, you're better off sort of being focused on what you're focused on, if that makes sense to you guys. We'll, we'll do our math, and we'll decide if the upside is big enough. And by the way, we don't even decide, is this a 3X opportunity or 10 Everyone's just looking for big, right? And it, it, you don't know. Later stage folks have to do the math of saying, do we really believe we can get a 3X? But at seed, at early stage, you're just saying, like, can this be really, really big? And usually they're looking for the billion-dollar company, but you don't need to say this will be a billion-dollar company, even though I know it says otherwise. But you bring up another good point, which is know your audience, right? So out here, for the most part, every VC is swinging big, right? And they only want to touch things for the slide that I showed that are going to be massive. There are a lot of angels, family offices, investors in different parts of the country that are thrilled to not swing as big and feel like they're swinging a little bit more steady. And so... When you're talking to them, you maybe are talking a little bit differently, or when you're talking down here, you're talking differently, or even better advice would be to say, what do you actually believe? What do you want to build? And then talk to the people who support what you want to build. Nothing's worse than someone who like wants to build a nice company that does a 5X and they'd love to sell at $100 million, and that's awesomeness to them. You say that to a VC out here the what not part of you. You say that to someone else, they may love every everything about it. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so the anatomy of a pitch deck. Oh, I'm not allowed to go towards that. I'm go- I have to come on this side. Okay, so first of all, you're always talking about your team, right? Because remember, we're on the other side. We don't... Oh. 
I'm going to do it again. We don't, all we, all we see are risks. And so the team, the idea and the team really matter. Some VCs will claim they over-index on team. They're less concerned about the idea. I don't know if that's true. We need both. We need to believe in the vision and we need to believe that it's the, the team that can do great things. And so the founding story matters in that you're trying to understand, does this team really need this to exist? Like, can they not kind of carry on without giving this a go? Or is this like an idea, and this is the, like version five of the ideas that they've been spinning around because they've been really wanting to start a company? It matters, and it matters a lot. And there's data that shows that the most successful startup CEOs are those who have sort of a a vision or a calling greater than themselves, right? So it's that idea that they kind of can't, they can't carry on without, without making this happen. That matters a lot because remember that slide of how hard it is? What keeps someone climbing after falling down and falling down and, you know, how hard it is, is this idea this must exist, right? So they're, they're missionaries. So the person who says, I, I just got out of business school. I looked at all these different markets. This one's really big. We think there's an opportunity to hear. Not that interesting. So your founding story often unlocks the unfair advantage or insight. Now, if you go on for 15 minutes into the details of it, you're not helping yourself either. So get that story tight, keep it honest, but you can also, you know, sort of get it together how you want, but there needs to be authenticity and, and sort of, and why you think it needs to exist. Oh. I'll ask, I'll, I'll get you in a second. Um, uh, but also, I've seen founders who will talk for 15 minutes of a half an hour pitch about how they had the idea. And it's like, you missed 15 minutes to, to take it to the next style. Yes. So when I talk about team, it's because usually there is more than one person coming in and, and talking to us. And I do recommend for all of you that you do the same because there's nothing like two sets of eyes and two sets of ears. And I often talk, and this may come up later, know your roles. So let's just pretend for a moment you're co-founders and you're CEO and she's COO or VP of finance, whatever it may be, know your roles. So when VC asks a question, the CEO should be the one that answers it, right? If, if you are the marketer, you're the CMO and co-founder, anything marketing, you should answer. So this idea of, you know, it's almost like you're cast in a movie a little bit, like play to your role. And the reason I say that is because you, one, don't want to show that there's confusion. Sometimes the meeting ends and you're like, so who's the CEO there? Um, sometimes someone who isn't the primary feels the need to show that they're smart too and they repeat what the other person says and you're like, I smell trouble there. Like, you know what I mean? So there are different red flags because we're just looking for anything, right? Like, we've got nothing to work with so all we can see is what we can see. So you don't want to have any red flags go up. So one... Sometimes people divide and conquer, and they just go in solo, and they talk about the awesome CTO, CMO, COO, and that's fine too, super efficient. Sometimes people um, bring in two because there's just nothing like two. There's just nothing like someone saying, actually, Jenny, what they, uh, what they meant when they asked that question wasn't what you just answered, it was this, right? Who can add value? And when you leave, you're like, what could I have done better? Where did I lose them? And so that, having someone who does that with you is really valuable. So that's that's a call of efficiency versus two, two eyes, two ears. Um, so, so that's the founding. Uh, the team. And another thing I'll just say is don't talk about your background for, once again, 15 minutes. Like I have literally had entrepreneurs come in and they tell me, and I was at SAP and at SAP at first I was running the this market and we were working and I mean, they go long into what they accomplish. And it's like, I often say that VCs have like the attention span of fleas. Tell what matters, right? So that they're like, you're worthy and then move on. But do, do not kill them with every last, you know, sort of minutia of your, of your background. So it, it's, a, it's a balance. Um, okay, so problem, the market size, um, you know, there's different points of view on how big does it have to be? What's, you know, does it have to be big at all? Um, in fact, there was, I don't know if you guys know, there's a great podcast uh, by Harry Stebbings called The 20 Minute VC and Peter Fenton, who's 
I mean, if he's not number one, he's top five VCs of ever. And he was saying he gets a good chuckle when he hears VCs like myself tell you that you want a big market. And, and he gives a reason why. So it is one that is controversial. And every entrepreneur says, okay, Jenny, you say big, but how big is big? And it's like, that's a really hard question to answer. And I'll explain why. So moral of my story is when I talk about problem needs a big market size, there's a few things to keep in mind. There is the overall market. There's the market that you can actually service, right? So there's TAM, and then there's SAM, which is serviceable market. And so a few things that turn people off. When you talk about, let's just say you're making it, uh, let's say, better conversion on checkout pages on e-commerce sites, or actually what I just had, a, a chat bot uh, on e-commerce sites. And they go on and on about how returns are 30% of the market, and they're just so fixated on the size of the market being about the size of the returns. It's like, well, you're not hitting that budget. So I get that you add value, but you have to be careful of where you sort of anchor yourself on market size. It has to be relevant. And then so you can sort of, you're really using market size to educate them on there is this much of the market. So I'll give you another portfolio example. BetterUp is a portfolio company of mine. They do uh, coaching for manager level people, not, not, not C-level. And it's more efficient, it's scalable. And so there is $67 billion to spend in the U.S., on something higher. I can't remember what it is, but development or whatever it is, employee development, blah, blah, blah. There's a piece of that that goes towards learning and development. And so they had a whole story about what they're selling, how it goes after that big piece of the market, and how in time, if they do their job right, they can grow into and eat a piece of the $67 billion market. And then they talk about the shifts going on in the market and therefore what makes it available. So market is, a, it's, it's not science. It's not just a number. It's a little bit of education of pieces of it, what's happening, what it's likely to be. And so when, when you listen, if you listen to Peter Fenton, he says like the best investments, the market may not exist. And so, yeah, that's true. Like Narvar, the company I talked about, there was no market for post-purchase experience spending. But I could talk about the market of e-commerce and how much they spend on the customer journey and blah, 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 you know, other things. So when I talk about market size, don't take it too literally that you have to know how much are people spending on that thing right now, because that's not the point. So your market is the number that's relevant to your vision. And so some people do it in circles, you know, and they say, you know, our vision and it, you're at the center of the circle. Yeah. And you're not even going to go out. So, but it shouldn't be completely tied to the one-two punch. The 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 vision in the market. The market is kind of education on how much is spent in this market, where it's spent, how it's spent, what you can kind of access immediately, and what macro changes are happening that make it available. When you then say, and here's where we're starting, you don't have to then have tied it to necessarily something. Ah, uh, yes. If you run a startup, you have two problems. Number one, you don't have enough revenue. And number two, every other problem in the world. Number one is the most important. You want to get that revenue dialed in and insight squared solves that problem, the not enough revenue problem. And they do it by providing all of the reports that your CRM doesn't. You don't want these surface level reports. You want to break through those surface level reports and see what is really driving or constraining revenue growth. Like, do you have the right pipeline in order to hit your goals? And how reliable are your reps at calling out what exactly is happening in forecasting? You know, you rely on your reps, you hire the best people you can, but sometimes the forecasting's off. Well, hundreds, and I mean hundreds, of VC-backed startups rely on Insight Squared to forecast better and more accurately and to better manage their pipelines and to coach their reps. These reps need coaching. They always do. Coffee is for closers. Bizarre Voice and Pendo rave about Inside Squared's ease of use and intuitive visualization. So here's your call to action. If you're a sales or sales operator, I want you to visit insightsquared.com slash twist, insightsquared.com slash twist, and get your free 25-minute sales pipeline consultation. This will help you identify which deals in your pipeline may be healthy, but are unlikely to close. 
That's right. Sometimes these things appear healthy, but they will not close. Find out exactly how much and what type of pipeline you need to beat your numbers. And make sure the not enough revenue problem isn't creeping up on you and catches you off guard. InsightSquared.com slash twist. InsightSquared.com slash twist to get started with your free sales pipeline consultation and find out why venture capitalist Josh Stein, my good friend from DFJ, says you're crazy if you're not using them. Insight Squared, welcome to the program. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. So how do we decide? So we do it less by, so it, it, it's a few different things. One is it's a big, important area, right? It's an area that has been lucrative to others in the past. So sometimes we'll say, God, like it, some people invest in ed tech, love them, harder to make money, right? So there's certain areas that are more lucrative. There's certain areas that are less lucrative. In the case of Narva, and I keep bringing it up just to kind of give you guys some color, I had to say, how big of a market, how much do retailers spend on their e-commerce infrastructure and customer journey? Are there any companies that have done incredibly well and had wonderful exits who are playing in there? Granted, it's not a direct competitor, but it's in the same landscape coming out of a similar budget. Okay, that's interesting. So maybe that could be. Sometimes you also get extra points for something being hot, like supply chain and logistics could be hot because it's more and more important as people are getting so much shipped to them and consumer expectations are rising, right? So sometimes you just kind of recognize there, there's there been winners in this market. I think they really have a way to scale their revenue and it's such a hot market, someone probably will want to buy them even if they can't IPO, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not as clean cut as you may think it is. I wish I had a better answer. It's, I mean, it's something that I struggle with constantly. Is the founder compelling or special? Will they stay the course? That goes back to these attributes, right? Like you look at someone's resume, they were six months, six months, six months, six months, or this is the fifth pivot that I'm doing or, you know, whatever it is. And by the way, none of us are perfect from our past. Like get over it. It's just a matter of they're looking for, we are looking for resilience, smart, good communication, ability to attract top talent, the, you know, all the stuff that you could Google online, like what do VCs want in entrepreneurs? You You'll see that list. Um, so on market size, is it, so what we're questioning is, is this market large enough? Is there anything about the market or co competitive landscape that makes it impossible to win? And why now? So I talked a little bit before about the why now. What you don't ever want to be is in the position of there is this massive company and they're not doing something today and that's what you're doing, but they could do it tomorrow and you are out of luck. Like you, you're, you're ruined. VCs don't like that. And so you want to know, and we're going to talk about competitive landscape and you're going to be like, you're kind of contradicting yourself. It's like, we want to know that there are, like we're playing with the big boys, right? Or girls. Um, but that like, there are big companies. So sometimes people do their competitive landscape and they put themselves versus like five startups we've never heard of. Less interesting. Oddly enough, or maybe sort of counterintuitive, if you look at a competitive landscape and say like, here's where Airbnb is asleep right? Here's, so it's like you do this positioning, you actually like big companies on the competitive, it, it's more the positioning, because that's what triggers, this is lucrative. Now, when you want to get into the startups that have been funded, you can do a side-by-side -side matrix and more talk about features, but just remember that we're looking to say this could be big. So if no one's doing anything and there's five startups who are being funded, that's not as interesting. I don't know if that, does that make sense? Okay. Um, so solution. So you talk about your product and vision. This is a little bit like the one-two punch, just the two. Like here's where we're beginning. Here's why we're beginning this way. Here's the traction we've had with this beginning. Um, and you're, you're, you know, depending on where you are in your life cycle of your company, you can start talking about unit economics. You can start talking about a sales, uh, the cost to acquire, the lifetime value. So this is where you're kind of, kind of, going to tell them, uh, you know, what, what we're trying to figure out, which is, is the product compelling? Is it working? Is the monetization strategy feasible? So that's what we're trying to figure out. So you have to figure out what you've got to work with that can make us feel like check, check on, on the right-hand side of this slide. 
So um, next steps are really important. So it's great when founders sort of understand that this all happens in milestones, right? So everyone begins somewhere, right? You, you, you start small. And sometimes founders are almost embarrassed. Like, I have this big vision, but I only have, I mean, I feel silly. I only have this. It's like everyone only had this to begin. So, so here you are. Here's what you're going to do next. And with the funding that you're, that you're going to raise, let's just pretend for a moment, with the $2 million that we're going to raise, that will enable us to prove A, B, and C with some cushion, because we know everything takes longer than we thought. And so, but that gets us about 18 months, assuming worst case, no revenue. That kind of talk is VC talk, because it's like you understand what you want to accomplish. You understand that things t are longer and harder. You don't have to say that, by the way. I'm just saying, like, but getting that and having it tie into your funding ask. So, so many times entrepreneurs will say to me, how much should I raise? I'm like, you work backwards. What's your next milestone that makes you less risky to me, right? And what do you need to do to achieve that? How long is that going to take? How much money is that going to take? Double it, cushion it however you want. That's how much you should be raising. So sometimes people just need a little bit and they can prove, you see, I've got demand. Or they need a lot because they can prove something even bigger. So that's sort of TBD. But just going out there and just trying to get some funding and seeing what you can get, it may, may be your reality, but you don't say that out loud. Yeah. How, yes. how much time do you spend on each of these, right? Because, like, you have a limited amount of time. And so, and I don't mean to say you shouldn't, like, how much time you should talk about the founder. I'm just saying don't kill it too much. So I don't have an answer to that because your market explanation may be critical, right? There's a market, they know nothing about it. And if they don't understand it, they don't give a damn about your solution because they didn't even get the market. Sometimes it's super Watch simple. It. Oh, sorry. Sometimes it's super simple. So I would say that in general, and it's going to come up, I'll give you some more in a bit. I, there's no answer. And you're going to figure it out. And if you're paying attention in your meetings, when someone's like, yeah, 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 I, I got it. I, yeah, I got it. Then you move on, right? You're not like, wait, I haven't gotten to port in four yet, you know? No. <laughs> you can laugh, but sometimes people do that, yeah. So, um, okay, so once again, explain the problem well. And the thing is, is that never assume that they know what you're working on or that they never assume that they understand your market. And at the same time, when they do, and it, like I'll often say to a founder, listen, I'm sold on the problem you're solving. My question is about ABC, but not everyone does that. So just try to pick up on where they are. And if they're like, totally, to it's like, great, let me fly by that. But what happens is, is that, and it's funny because uh, I gave this presentation with Jess Lee at Sequoia to a different group, and she got into, you know, trying to explain to, to men that tampon, on demand, you know, having tampon delivery was important. They're like, is it really a big problem? Right, is it really? So you have to understand, like, who are you pitching? Do they know anything about what you're talking about? If you've done your homework, you see what they've invested in, you know kind of what they're about, so you'll know if what you're pitching them is so in their real house or so out of their real house. Like, we were talking about dogs, and she knows that we've made a bunch of investment in dog type things, so she didn't have to say, people love their pets so much. It's like, I got it. Like, you know I've got it. And she moved on to the next. Um, and, you know, it's funny. We say use an analogy. Um, Sometimes that really bites you, to be totally honest, because some people like to pick apart why it's not the same, right? So you're really not the Uber of blank. And so sometimes it's helpful if, they, if you can't do it without it. Sometimes it just annoys people like me, or you get someone who feels the need to prove where you're wrong. And you spend your meeting early on in the wrong, having the wrong conversation. So I know it's up here, but I would just say, use an analogy if you have to. Like I'm in a business that's in health tech, that's um, communication between the front office and the patient, okay? And so, and it's, so appointments, making appointments, reminders, blah, blah, blah. If he says I'm the slack of healthcare, VCs are like, oh, interesting, right? If he tries to actually explain what he does, they're like, mm -hmm. you know, so sometimes you need it and sometimes you don't. And when you don't, I would say don't. Okay, so here's where I, uh, I'm just going to sort of just talk random things. So one is you have to have a deck. 
I promise you, you have to have a deck. I don't care if it never, anyone sees your deck, you must have a deck because it's like Mark Twain's quote, like, you know, I would have written a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time. When you go and you're pitching the casual conversation and you haven't done a deck, you are, you're all over the place. You have 10 points to make when you're trying to explain the market's big. When you actually make a deck, you it's discipline. You're forcing yourself to say, what's the smartest way to demonstrate that this is a big market? And you think about it 10 different ways, you come up with it. You can still then just have a casual conversation, but you know exactly what your key points are. So whether or not you show it or don't show it is irrelevant. I'm a beyond believer in creating a deck and you having practiced it, it's ingrained in your brain. Another reason this is important is VCs will take you off path. And if you don't know it inside and out, you will follow them, you'll leave the meeting, and you wouldn't have made the key points you need to make for them to care. So if you, you know, if someone, if you're trying to sell them on something and you know your key points because you made your deck and you know they really need to understand boom, 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 to be interested in a second meeting. And if you start saying hypothetically, like, you know, what about AI? Could AI be applied there? And let's talk about that. You can't say, let's not talk about that because that's not relevant. You can't do that. But at the same time, if you start just answering their questions and talking about what they want to talk about, it may feel good in the moment. Like we're connecting. I'm answering his questions. And you leave, they don't know anything about your business and why it's important. So if you have your pitch in your head, so, so, so in there, it's like a beautiful dance where they can ask the question and say, AI is definitely something that we that I could have a long conversation with you about. It's interesting, but just for because I know your time is is limited, I want to make sure that we get through. And so you're super, you acknowledge, but you try to bring it back to your flow. Um, so be fluid, don't lose control of the meeting, which is the point I just made. Stay high. So to your question of how much time where, so much better to be high and have a wonderful appendix section that has all those questions you're worried they may ask. A lot of entrepreneurs feel the need to show they know everything, right? So what they do is they come in and they tell you everything. And we're left with a headache instead of inspired. So your goal of the meeting is to get the next meeting. Now, one person is going to say, I really want to, I, I know you're saying CAC is going to be this, but I need to go deeper on that. Like, what are your sources? Oh, interesting. Let me pull it up in the appendix. Great. For the next person who doesn't give a crap about CAC, because that's not their area, you didn't kill them with all the information. So all those things that you're like, gosh, I feel weird not putting it in my deck, but someone's going to ask appendix. And I got to tell you, it's one of those tricks that works bizarrely well, even though I know it and I'm telling you the trick, it still works on me. Like it just looks like, wow, they really know their stuff. So use it. Um, so this is a funny one, but investors, and it may hit a little bit on the bias, but investors want to back entrepreneurs that they will enjoy working with. So you have to be honest and you cannot be a robot. You cannot go in and say, this is a such and such size market and we are doing it this way. And like, you have to be a human being who is passionate and smart and thoughtful and open-minded and hardworking and and telling them your story. And so you can't go fake. You can't be like, oh, how about them warriors when you don't care about the warriors? I'm not talking about that and that kind of connect. But people will figure out the different styles. And sometimes people leave and it's like, I can work with that person, you know, or I just, I can't work with that person. I asked them a question. They never even answered it. They, you know, or they gave some bullshit answer and I, that didn't feel good. I'd rather someone say when they don't know what they don't know. So you'd be surprised how much you're being judged, not by the content, but by your communication style, your openness, your passion, which is jumping down to here, trying to enjoy the process. So I once got close to making an investment in a company and went to have a working session with him and it wasn't good. He was very defensive. It was just like, I, I, was, I was just not, I left saying, I don't know if I can work with him. So I called one of the early angels and said, here's my issue. And she said, no, he's amazing to work with. He's not defensive at all. He's VC fatigued. 
You all have asked him. He's now on to, you know, and this is a guy, everyone and their mother had passed up. They're doing so well right now, by the way. So it, as if, if 20 people say no to you, just keep on keeping on. You'll find the right person. But, um, but the point was he was not enjoying the process, and I don't judge him for that, but that lack of enjoyment sent off signals to me that I didn't know was lack of enjoyment. So my point is, treat a VC almost like a free business consultation. Like, oh my God, they've seen so much. Like, bring it. Really? You think this is not the right approach? This is why we think it is. But if you are like showing that you're like upset or nervous or defensive or whatever, like you're being judged on that behavior. So the more you can sort of rub your temples and truly just say like, at the end of the day, this thing is going to happen. I don't know if it's my first meeting or my hundredth meeting, but I'm going to learn a lot in the meantime. And if you have that attitude, you will actually end up being more attractive to the person on the other side. Um, and then I talk about learning from every meeting. I mean, I cannot stress this enough. To some extent, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but if you don't walk out of every meeting with... Ugh, I'm still tripping them up when I talk about the market size or, God, the way I answer that question. If you're not tweaking your pitch deck, tweaking how you say something, changing your flow, you're not paying attention. And so, you know, yeah, we can all pretend we're little snowflakes over here in the VC land, but we're really not. And so there's a lot of similarity. So if you're not like, wow, I mean, I did this in my second company. Every time we explain recognized revenue versus bookings, we'd lose them. And we're like, okay, we got to do that better. We can't do that again. We can't do And it took a few revs, but my point is learn. And that's when I talked about having someone else in the room. It's really helpful because you're so on talking and pitching. It's really good when someone else can be the listener. I keep losing my thingy. <laughs> I'm going to skip for, for timing wise. I'm worried that I won't cover what you guys care the most about. So we already talked a bit about milestones, knowing your audience. So I'm going to just skip the process. My high level is have a process. Even if you know that like your process doesn't matter until you get it, you're, you're not in control. It is better for you to know, okay, I'm having my first round of meetings th these three weeks. Then, you know, and, and have one. And then revise as reality hits. Oh, I turned it off, but that's okay because I think we wanted time for Q&A. So we had a bunch of questions throughout. I'm gonna get, oh, oh actually, we had a question from you. Well, let's get yeah, some. Yeah, how do you do it? Good, so the fist like this. Oh. Sorry. Julie, you had a question? Very sorry, cool. I saw your hand. Not hip. <laughs> so I have a question. Yes. Um, we've raised $3 million to date through two rounds, like a friends and family, a seed round, and now we're going for our Series A this summer. What do you think the biggest difference, I know this was more seed, yeah. the, the two or three biggest difference, obviously I know it's more metrics driven, traction, things like that, but what would be your advice on how you change your approach to that kind of seed to your Series A? Yeah, great question. So I would say that, first of all, that whole founding story and how you had the aha, make it shorter and quicker. And you kind of do a little bit of a reset. Like, here's who we are. It's not this thing we want, you know, watch your verbs. So we are the leading blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, it's working really well. And here's where we're headed. And, and you do spend more time in you're trying to show that you're scalable, repeatable. So it's you're a little bit more science. You don't kill them with data, you know, galore. So you still have to talk about the market. You still have to talk about the opportunity. You still have to talk about the team. But you're you almost have to do a mental reset. Don't take your old C deck and then change a few slides. Say, okay, I'm going to do a new deck, and now I explain to them we are this. This is what we're doing. Here's what's been working. Here's how this next round of financing will let me step on the gas to do A, B, and C so that I'll be here. So it's a little bit, you, you're almost like a little less selling the idea and you're more selling, we are that and it's working. Yeah. One, one way to just think about it in a couple of words is when you're doing those early seed rounds, you're selling the promise of the company. Yes. And when you're doing a series A or if it's really a series B, but called an A, you're selling the performance. So at one point you're selling promise, another time you're selling performance. And just know those two differences. Sometimes when you're gonna have the 2.0 project product coming out, people are like, okay, let's wait until we get the 2.0 product in market, and then we'll go raise. 
it's actually a mistake. You could raise on the promise of the 2.0 product. Like this is our 1.0, it got us to a half million in revenue. And we're just gonna show you the product, the 2.0. We're not raising right now, or we're gonna be raising after we have six months of it, but this is the 2.0. And then they say, whoa, well, what if we want to invest right now? <laughs> so always the promise. So as an example, Cafe X has the 2.0 machine. It's sitting and they've been working on it. It's working the last two months. I just whispered in a couple of my VC friends' ears, the 2.0 machine is incredible. Oh, when can we see it? I'm like, talk to Henry. I'm sure he'd love to show it to you. And they go by the warehouse and they see it. Now, the 2.0 machine is right now um, at uh, 1 Bush Street outside in an enclosure, and it will be opening up in, I don't know, 10 days. So it's sitting right there. The public's going to see it. But who knows? Maybe before then, somebody will be like, you know what? I don't want the other investors to have that opportunity. I'll take this out right now. Right. Just because I think it's more interesting sometimes to disagree, I'll also say that be careful if you're telling someone something's going to happen in a month. In a month, we're turning on monetization. Great. Let me see how it goes in a month, right? Or they even start engaging. So you have to watch out for 2.0 and see where you're going to place it. So if 1.0 is awesome, that works beautifully, right? You're like, I'm already a believer. And if once everyone sees 2.0, I'm hosed because now I'm in line with every other VC. So that can be really effective. I've seen companies try to raise with something that's just about to happen. And every VC is like, great. Let's watch it happen, and then and then I'll, and then and then let me see. Um, and then so you have to, I, I actually agree with you. You have to be self-aware, and I think you can even unpack it more. Which is, if I like what your point, like if the 1.0 is that good, then people are going to go, well, they're credible. Their 1.0 is so good. Yeah. Well, of course the 2.0 is going to be kerosene because they're better at what they do. But if they if your 1.0 is kind of shitty or you barely stumble to the finish line, they're going to be like, you know what? There's no reason for us. Let's see. Let's turn over a couple of more cards, as they say in poker. Let's see what the flop looks like. Then maybe I'll make a big bet. Let me wait to the turn. Oh, fuck it. I'm going to wait to the river and see if these guys actually have a hand. Yeah. And a lot of VCs will do that. They'll just wait you out. Especially for A's. So seed, a little bit less. But in A's, man, they've been waiting it out. So it used to be once you had 100K MRR, you went to talk to them. Then it became 200K. Now it's like talk of 300K. So they're, they're waiting later in that poker hand for more. And so the other thing is, while I do agree, I love the way you put it, of the promise versus the performance, I do have companies that if they get too much into because the performance is fantastic, but if they don't see that massive billion dollar thing, they're not interested. So that, that's great. You have 300K MRR, but I don't think this gets to be a billion dollar company. So you still can't. It, it, Jason's totally right. It's you're not going. You're not going anywhere without the performance, but you still have to sell the promise of it being massive. Yeah, it's a similar question, diving a little bit deeper here. Uh, it's also the question has a couple of assumptions, so if they're incorrect, please course correct me. <clears throat> my, qu my question is, you know, we're, we're referencing a Series A, 300K, seed, idea, and team. Now there's this new seed plus. Are, are there metrics and expectations around th that? Or what, what's the middle ground between idea and team and 300K MR? I'm going to just go out and say, like, the names keep changing and the names mean different things to everybody. So think about how much you're raising and and then it's a matter of where you are and have have you mitigated any have you checked off any risks, right? So two I said I'm seed, but guess what? You and your idea, I sent to my pre-seed friends. So it's like be careful of the name because what seed now used to be series A, kind of get over it. Decide how much you're raising. And for the things that we already discussed, right, milestones, what you need to prove, decide how much you're raising, figure out who writes those size checks, and that's how you should handle it. Understood. She's, Thank you. She's right. And, you know, the names don't matter. And the expectation now is if your business is growing, you can just keep raising seed round after seed rounds after seed round. And if it's going up and to the right and the VCs aren't ready to pull the trigger, you might see people raise five seed rounds, you know, or friends and family, angel, seed, seed plus, seed extension, bridge, pre-series seed, pre-series A, series A. Like, there's all different names for it. The thing that matters in a series A is a top-tier venture firm is leading a priced round and joining the board. Those are the qualities of a series A. A, a, top, a firm is putting a board member on, leading the round, pricing the round, setting the terms, and they're going to have a share price at the end, right? It's not a convertible note. Everything that's a convertible note and hundreds of thousands to millions, that's all seed. I think you just call it all seed. And I'll just add a little bit to that, that 
there's I I believe there's bias against the people who kind of snack along the way instead of take a meal, make it to the next stop, go for another meal. And so if you can raise a little more and get to that next point, you will be better off. You will be more attractive. Not having notes converting at the same time, you could argue the math doesn't matter, but it does to the person writing the check. So I'm not going to kill you with the details, but the more you can not just nibble, nibble, nibble on whatever you can get, better. If that's your reality, do it. And the day your business is booming, no one will care. Yeah, it looks quite spastic too. Like if you're raising every six months, yeah. people start to go, why, why can't you raise 18 months of runway and just keep your head down? Because exactly. by the time you raise six months of runway, it takes two or three months to close. And now you've got two or three months of runway. Guess what? You got to back, get back out on the road. They just think you're not a considered person. Now, if it's all you can do and that's how you stay alive, then who cares? You're alive. So it doesn't matter. No judgments. Go. Hi, Jenny. Uh, thanks for um, being here. Um, sure. So speaking of raising more, um, hi, I'm, I'm Chukes, founder of Pilsi. Um So last year we did a we did a seed round. We um, we set out to do a 500k round. We ended up closing 850 um, just around uh, Thanksgiving. We decided to stagger our round uh, our closing to two rounds. So now we're doing a second closing, um, about 400k. We have 300 300 now in commitment, and we have 100,000 left. So my question to you is: Is how often have you seen? having multiple seed rounds before you get into an A round? And also, um, are there any detrimental detrimental um, facts to this? Well, are the terms the same? Roughly, yeah. Yeah, so you'll package it up. No one cares if it was a one close, two close, three close. Nobody even has to know. So, hey, we raised 1.2 million on these terms. Now we're raising this. They don't care when it hit your bank account. So I would say don't worry about that. If you do the terms change, terms change, term change, then you start to look like a little bit of a snacker, in my opinion. Yeah, and the other thing is, at the end of the day, they're going to just say sure. to their attorney, okay, um, just show me the pro forma cap table, convert all this shit, nonsense, and notes, yeah. saves, whatever, Wh whatever mistakes they made, let's clean this up. Is there anybody, any dead money on the cap table? Let's buy them out. Let's just clean up this cap table. Do the founders have enough money? When do they start investing? Okay, let's reset their vesting, or let's add a year to their vesting. And uh, is it, you know, there, oh, there's you paid some consulting firm, you know, eighteen percent, or you gave an incubator in Boise, Idaho, fifteen percent for twenty five k. Like, okay, they're out. We're gonna go have a phone call with them, and you know, that's the kind of cleanup stuff that happens. So just they're gonna look at your cap table. So you should be looking at your cap table. One of the big, colossal mistakes people are making is they are just like, you know what, that cap table is super complicated. I don't exactly know how it works. And I'm really scared of what it's going to look like when they actually convert it. Fuck it, I'm sticking my head in the sand. As opposed to, you know, I'm going to take the medicine and have somebody walk me through this cap table and show me the different scenarios. And it's scary, but you, then you start doing the cleanup. I couldn't agree more. So as VCs, I'm not proud of this, but I'm just going to say you got a lot going on. you got to figure out where you're going to dig in. And so the more you hit all the points that I've already discussed, the better. And the cleaner your cap table is, the better. Sometimes VCs are almost looking for a reason not to dig in. So you're like, oh, my God. Oh, God. The cap table is such a mess. And this other company over here, I really like them, too. I mean, it's just one of those things that doesn't make you look as attractive. We it's not the end of the world. It's yeah. just something better to be a clean cap table than a non-clean cap it, And table. it can be cleaned up. I mean, there was a company that had, you know, a third founder. They had all vested all of their shares. The two founders and the attorney said to the third founder, we're going to take you from 20 points down to four points, or they're not raising their next fund and these two guys are leaving. They're going to start a new company and we're going to shut this company down. They're going to do their next idea. So yeah. either take 4% or nothing and we'll give you 100K for that other 16 for the year you did work without money. And that's it. And the, or this investor's not coming. And a lot of times I'll get an email like, hey, we have to do this. We're going to clean this up and, you know. Yeah, you're bad with it. <laughs> that's it. It's got to be cleaned up sometimes. Okay. Are you saying that's a wrap? That's yeah, a wrap. That's great. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Round of applause. Thank you. Okay.